Well, you know, I, I first started practicing Zazen, Zen meditation, when I was about 17, so about four years ago. And then about uh, two years ago, I was in the Netherlands at a place called Leiden University, and I was studying Sanskrit, but I was also working on a thesis project uh, on the transmission of Zen Buddhism into modern cultures. And uh, that's when I encountered Ken's work, and uh, he seemed to be one of the only people who really knew what was going on there with the, uh, with, with the dynamics of that process. And it's very complex, but I think uh, that a major part of the academic study uh, of Buddhism uh, has uh, it's been deficient in that it has imposed certain uh, ideological frameworks, certain worldviews, uh, certain postmodern conceptions onto the Buddhist traditions uh, because of a, a kind of superficial similarity. So the idea of pratitya samutpada, uh, dependent co-arising in Buddhism, uh, is identified with uh, a kind of deconstructive idea of uh, relativism and uh, fragmented pluralism. Uh, and uh, basically there's a conflation between two kinds of uh, relativity. Uh, the one kind is the kind identified by Shakyamuni and Nagarjuna, uh, which is uh, to say that all phenomena, all dharmas, are relative in the sense that uh, they're all arising uh, in dependence upon other phenomena. Uh, that's the, the notion of dependent arising. Uh, but then there's this Western kind of postmodern notion of relativism, uh, which is basically that you know, all truth, all meaning, uh, all value is relative to a particular parochial context, a particular cultural context. And uh, uh, there can be no universal claims, essentially. Uh, that doesn't have anything to do with the Buddhist tradition or what Nagarjuna was saying, in a sense. So this idea starts coming to the surface uh, in people who, postmodern scholars who are interpreting uh, Buddhist uh, thinkers like Nagarjuna and Chandrakirti, uh, and the idea is that uh, somehow there, there's a kind of alignment between what those people were saying and what uh, Jacques Derrida is saying. Uh, and, I, and I really think that's misleading uh, in ways that have been devastating uh, for the tradition, especially uh, in academic interpretations. Uh, now, Ken, I think, diagnosed a lot of the the most significant uh, problems. Uh, one is that uh, the, the practice of uh, meditation or any kind of contemplative practice, whether it's Buddhist or not, only cultivates a particular stream of human development, of which there are many. Uh, so it has to be supplemented uh, by a whole uh, constellation of other practices, of other disciplines, uh, and it has to be situated within uh, that kind of more comprehensive spectrum. Uh, and I think there, there's also, as a consequence of some of these academic developments, uh, this kind of deconstructive approach to interpreting uh, the Buddhist tradition, uh, I think uh, it, it's, it's been devastating uh, in terms of ethics uh, within the tradition, too, uh, because it, it basically reduces uh, or it, it collapses uh, relative uh, and absolute truth, uh, which is, in a sense, the, the ultimate non-dual realization, but it collapses them rhetorically in a way that uh, involves uh, an abandonment of any kind of ethical position. Uh, so there's this rhetoric of non-marginalization and non-judgmental, non um, uh, non-discrimination, uh, which is just a kind of rhetoric. And the ultimate non-dual realization is neither discriminating nor non-discriminating. It's neither dual, dual nor non-dual. Uh, but you get this, this kind of alignment of that postmodern rhetoric with non-dual realization, which is, again, extremely misleading. Uh, so I'm hoping that we can kind of forge ahead into some of the fertile frontiers on the horizon. Uh, and what I envisage is a, a totally new discipline uh, within the academic community of Buddhist studies or even in the larger religious studies community uh, of doing some of uh, what Ken calls mandalic science, 
reconstructing stages of uh, contemplative development uh, and um, trying to understand the semiotics of contemplative experience, so the kind of language that's used to describe phenomenologically meditative experiences, um, but then reconstructing them st structurally. Um, so those are two different uh, kind of academic disciplines or intellectual disciplines or rational disciplines uh, that can be used uh, to orient us towards the possibility of awakening uh, and to provide a vehicle of awakening, whereas the <laughs> deconstructive approach uh, tends, tends to conceal and obscure the possibility of enlightenment. And actually, you often hear that uh, the very idea of enlightenment is abandoned uh, because it would be marginalizing, because then we would have to distinguish between people who are enlightened and people who aren't enlightened. Uh, and, and that's not sensitive. Yes. Uh, so, 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 so it's a major problem. Uh, within the tradition because I mean, that's the, the very impetus of the tradition is to cultivate that experience of awakening. But whenever the student-teacher relationship is relinquished and the, disting the distinction between enlightened and unenlightened is relinquished, you don't have a much of a tradition left. Uh, so I think it's really a matter of skillful means. Uh, I mean, deciding what kind of uh, interpretive framework is appropriate for the tradition is just a matter of skillful means. There aren't any kind of philosophical requirements or uh, special ideological requirements uh, that, that, that demand that we have a certain interpretive framework. Uh, but I think that a more integral understanding uh, provides a, a more uh, potent and uh, efficacious vehicle of awakening uh, and of wisdom uh, and, and provides more orientation uh, and, and fullness and richness. So. Uh, hopefully I can make a small contribution to that kind of vision. Uh, and I think this conversation will, will definitely be a significant advance in that direction, too. Thank you. That's very articulate. And those of you from alternative colleges, that's known as intellectual discourse. And <laughs> we, we, they're rushing the stage. We, we will have translations for you later. If you, <laughs> um, but I mean, I, I do have to say, Patrick, I mean, I, as somebody who spent a lot of time of ride, uh, writing and trying to, to bring a certain elegance and you know, hopefully a little bit of even beauty to academic discourse, I, uh, I, I, I love Patrick's writing and his speaking seriously. I think he's so elegant, and, and I just I think it's fantastic. So thank you for those points.